Hello and welcome to Banya Chats. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, we're going to be looking at the. Um, we're going to be looking at some of the thing, some of the children that uh, cut. Uh, some of the th reasons why children come into care, not reasons. Um, and I'm here with Verna. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I would like to uh, invite you all to Banya Summit. This is happening at, on Thursday, the 17th of September. So this Thursday, it's starting at 1 p.m. and it's finishing at 8 p.m. We're going to be talk, discussing lots of different topics, including the story of Banya that's going to be presented by the founder, Niasha. And I'm going to be there talking about my experience of why I come into care. I'll be discussing it with other care leavers. Um, and we're going to be talking about other topics, such as the rewards of fostering. So I hope to see you there. Uh, the link to the summit where you can get your tickets will be in the comments below uh, and I look forward to seeing you. Uh, so today uh, we're going to be discussing the needs of children in care and I have Verna Casey with me who is one of Banya's senior practitioners. Hello Verna, how are you doing? Hi, today? hi Tom, yes I'm, I'm, I feel very privileged to be part of this um, uh, presentation so Yes, um, I'm looking forward to joining in and sharing my um, knowledge and um, background experiences on this mm -hmm. topic. Your expertise in it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I lo 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 lovely to have you on here. Um, you actually did were doing it with my case as well, weren't you? Uh, sorry, could you just what? say that again, Tom? Oh, yes. Yeah, so apologies. You were with. Uh, looking, you looked over my 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 case when I was growing up in care. Yes, I believe I did have contact with your carers. Um, I was supervising the supervisor, who was your um, carers um, uh, SSW. Yes, so I knew quite a bit about your your journey. Yes, it, it, it was a it was a bit of a roller coaster, wasn't it? We can well, you. you've come out the other end. That's the main thing. I have. Come Here out you the are other to end. tell the tale. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, one of the would you like to discuss some of the needs of the children that come into care? Yes. Um, in terms of um, the range of needs that children have, um, we'll cover a, a whole range. Um, today, I believe we're focusing on um, specific um, needs that may cover behaviours may mm -hmm. cover disabilities and may cover challenges that come as a result of trying to meet those needs and how they can be met through the support that can be offered. Yeah. yeah. So when, obviously I, I can understand, I, can, I think I can relate to this because mm. I am a person with disabilities and um, obviously that comes with its own set of difficulties on top of the fact that it is a child in care that may have received um, abuse or neglect. So they have to deal with the disabilities as well. Sure. Yes, um, there's a multi-layer of, of, of needs that children will present with. And um, if we think about disabilities to start with, um, dis disabilities within its own right, regardless of the fact that children are in the care system will also present its challenges to, to the parents. Now, if the needs can't be met within the family home um, and that child needs to be uh, looked after, um, he now or she now is carrying two kind of, you know, heavy labels of being looked after and being a child with uh, a disability. Um, and then we need to then look at the placement that we put that child in, in terms of how the carers can actually meet those needs um, specific to that child. Uh, some carers will, um, will, you know, be suited to, to, to be matched with such a child because they may have a background of maybe teaching, you know, the 
education system, they may have um, a, a connection with the health services, they, they may have been child minders, they may have worked in residential care. So they may come with some already existing skills that they can transfer into this role as um, not only being a foster carer, but meeting the needs of a child with a disability. Mm. Children with disabilities, um, you know, will come under a specialist team. So um, once their disability is diagnosed and recognised, um, it then puts them within a team that is, is, is specialist in the areas of support that's required to meet those needs. And that can come with a range of packages, um, you know, as, 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 as small as um, some respite support that might be needed, um, uh, that might be just within the home. It can extend to respite support that might be outside the home. There's respite centres for children with disabilities. There are holiday centres for children with disabilities. There's specialist um, school summer schemes for children with disabilities. Um, some children with disabilities will be in what we call special schools that are particular, particularly tailored to meet um, the needs of children with um, who might be wheelchair bound who, or who have um, quite um, complex and profound needs. And some children with disabilities may actually be in mainstream school um, mm -hmm. because, in fact, their physical disabilities are the is the aspect of their needs that need to be met um, with a particular skill but their mental and emotional and cognitive capacity is um, perfectly functioning. They're perfectly able to engage and receive um, education at the same level as any other child of a similar age. So some children are integrated within mainstream school with special needs, with, with special disabilities or special um, circumstances where their physical needs um, require extra support. But they are able to, to, to learn within the, um, the, the um, normal schooling um, environment. Oh, I'm sorry, my phone's gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it happens, don't yeah. worry. I'm live as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, so uh, the, those things... Um, you know the the the, the um, needs of the children. You know will be identified in terms of to what extent their needs can be met within mainstream school or within a special a specialist school environment. Mm. It, um, the, it, sorry, go on. No, it's all about like finding out the needs of the child, what support they need, and give, giving it to them so that they can develop properly and grow to their full potential, isn't it? That's right. I mean, every child that comes into the care system will have a care. Um, a care plan um, and that plan is tailored to the needs of that child with a child with disabilities or extra additional needs that care plan just extends to ensuring that all of the needs across the range of needs that they may present with can and are being met um, and that might mean that quite a extensive team of professionals are around that child and young person um, because of the specialist aspects of the needs that they they have so it could be um ot's which are occupational therapists who um do quite a, a lot of um th their role is quite extensive um so ot's might be familiar to people um who may have been in hospital and maybe recovering from an injury and they're trying to get the body to you know get back to its original functioning capacity but with for children with disabilities, it may be that there's a capacity of their functioning that needs to be continually supported with mm. occupational therapy. So that service is there to um, ensure that any additional help that the child needs, it might be to, to be able to walk unaided or to walk with an aid or to use a pen with, with certain aids that can be adapted to support them to write or to draw or to paint or whatever that might be. Mm. Um, oh, so basically, uh, uh, like I, I, I've, I grew up and I, I had uh, OTs. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, had, um, I actually had one for, uh, was it, uh, to have a back brace. Right. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. they that would all be um, like organized and planned um, mm. 
because I had to be like checked to make sure it was still working. Okay. Uh, mm. Eventually, I I didn't need it because I, mm. I had the use exercise. That's another right. one. That's yeah, yeah. Physical yeah. therapy as well. Um, so you got yeah. that's part of the OT. Um, yeah. So you got all these doctors and specialists that's right. trying to. Well, physios and OTs you know, tend to work um, in tandem. Yeah, so yeah. Um, a physio might um, off, um, provide the ongoing support. The OT will assess your needs and provide whatever adaptations and um, aids that you might need. Um, and that's not only for you physically, also within the environment. So it might need a specialist bed. It might need additional um uh, you know, um, equipment within the home uh, to ensure that your safety is, um, or you know, protected. It might mean that you need a tailor-made car seat or um, adaptation within the car to, to ensure that you can sit comfortably and safely. So the OTs assess the needs of what your condition is presenting and try to enhance your independence. And that's something that's really important that People with or children with disabilities, it's really, um, you know, the key thing is to not, um, you know, inhibit their progress, but it's to enhance and, and support their development to the best capacity that they can within the limitations that they may have. But it's never to write off a child to say, well, they'll never be able to do this or never be able to walk, never be able to write, never be able to, you know, join in in, you know, competitive sports. Because if they need um, aids or something to support that, then that's where the OTs and the physios come in to, you know, provide the equipment and support that is needed. Mm. So the team around the child child um, becomes quite integral to the care that this child um, receives. So um, a lot of children who might be on what we call the um, moderate to severe end of disabilities will invariably be on what we call an EHCP plan, which is the old, which is the new, um, the new way in which children with special needs um, uh, their needs are met under what we're calling an EHCP plan, which was originally a statement. You might have heard heard before, heard previously that children were statemented, and what that meant was that there was a statement of special educational needs, and that report would um, identify what their needs are, and then roll out what would be needed to support those needs within the education and health environment. Now it's called an EHCP, EHCP plan, which is Educational Health Care Plan. So it, it incorporates the education side and the health side, um, because quite, um, quite more often than not, where there might be educational needs with a child with disabilities, there'll also be health needs. And so it ensures that we're covering the full spectrum of the child's complete holistic needs that can be met within um, school and the home environment. So some children with disabilities may be in special schools that again are adapted and um, set up in a way that um, supports children coming in if they're not mobile within um, on in their wheelchairs, if they are mobile but they need aids and adaptations, it's catered for in a way that really um, embraces um, a range of different needs that can be um, met and accommodated within the education and the environment. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever been into a special school, but they're amazing environments. They there are sensory rooms. There are um, it, there's equipment that can help stimulate children who might be nonverbal. Um, you have to really find the thing for some children that will um, enable them to have some response and, and interaction. Mm -hmm. And the EHCP plan, it takes account of where their needs might be at one particular stage, and it's, it's reviewed on an ongoing basis. So it's never static. It continues to look at how that child is progressing and whether there needs to be changes made to that plan, whether there needs to be new um, 
decisions made about aspects of the needs or whether things are improving that well that some aspects of the needs are no longer as acute as they might have been six months ago or a year ago. So it is an ongoing um, review, uh, an ongoing plan that continues to be reviewed. Yeah. Um, the other thing that um, attracts uh, children with disabilities is uh, an allowance that we call DLA, which is Disability Living Allowance. And that is paid for the child or the young person, and it's assessed um, according to the level of need that that child or young person has. So if their needs are quite um, moderate and of um, a lower um, capacity in terms of the way their needs might be affected in their day-to-day -day life, then they would go on the lower rate. So it might be that they might need assistance to go to the bathroom. Um, they may um, need assistance to be um, for, for meal times. Um, they may have quite a you know a level of independence that still means that they can function without assistance continually, um, twenty four hours around the clock. And then the other extreme will be children who need a very high intensity, intense level of support really on an ongoing basis around the, the, the day and, and, and often into the night. So they, those children will, will attract a higher rate of disability living allowance. So this allowance then enables the carer, the built-in within the allowance is a carer's um, fee that it enables that carer to be able to access support that they want or need to be able to meet the, the needs of that child or to, to, to ensure that there's a balance between what the carer is being, is able to provide and looking after the carer in, in terms of taking a break when they might need to. So that this allowance can be used to pay for additional support, can be used to pay for somebody to come in and sit with the young person. It can be used for somebody to take that young person out it can be used for um, specialist equipment and additional um, resources that the child might need that you wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. Um, there's um, things like play mats and flashing lights and um, you know various um, aids and um, equipment that can be used within the home. I've often seen where the equipment that the school have can be mirrored within the home so that the child will get the ongoing continuity of the approach that's used within the school environment, that that can be used within the home. So those resources are um, provided within the home and it can be, um, you know, um, purchased from the um, allowance because often those um, types of equipment can be quite costly and, um, and expensive. So. Uh, there's a catalogue that's used to, 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 to get those from specialist um, suppliers. Yeah. So there, obviously there's a lot of support that is given mm -hmm. to a, mm -hmm. uh, a, child, a, a child in care and it's providing the correct support and mm -hmm. making sure it's an ongoing mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I understand this because I had a, I, I grew up at the time um, before the EHC plan, did you say? Yes, EHCP yeah, plan, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I had a statement instead. Yeah. That was reviewed, I think it yeah. was annually or every six months, so mm -hmm. very often. Um, but I also, like, growing up as someone like that, it also present. it's also quite difficult because it's not just about the physical side of it. It's also um, how it uh, affects uh, it may help affects your mental health as well. Because, um, as like you growing up as someone, you um you see people uh, grow and develop and do these things, and then sometimes you just can't do them, and yes. that can be very yeah. frustrating. Frustrating, yeah. And that can lead yeah. to you know mm. outbursts and such. But I I, I had a few. Um, mm. I'm, I'm not afraid to admit that. Um, because it's just frustration because you want to do what everyone else can do yeah but absolutely you, you feel misunderstood and we you know we often recognize that 
people with disabilities um, to the general public may um, evoke a certain level of fear in the able-bodied person because they don't know what how to you know respond to this situation and it could be that there's all kinds of prejudices and um, messages that they've received about what it means to be a person with a disability to be um, in a wheelchair or to need to use an aid or adaptation that the able-bodied person is is um, interpreting their own view of what that person you know how to treat that person or respond to that person and not really um i would say that i guess as a person with a disability all you want to be is accepted and treated you know with a level of respect and acceptance just like everybody else yeah. so in terms of being aware of prejudices and um discrimination around disability there's a lot that has progressed within society i would say yeah, over the years absolutely. Um, you know, there's a lot more um, even just access for, for, you know, people with a disability to get into, um, you know, social places and public spaces. Um, there's much more um, recognition and awareness of, you know, where, where you need to have a curb lowered or um, wider, you know, um, access doors or whatever it might be, that that is becoming much more accepted that within our environment and our society, we see how um, those areas have progressed over, over time. And it, it's taken time. And, um, you know, I would say that we've probably still got a long way to go. Um, there's still a lot of places that are not accessible for people with a disability who might be wheelchair bound. So um, you do have to negotiate and, you know, shout with your voices and um you know really be able to um as you grow up because you grow up with a certain message that you might not be good enough or not not be you know seen or treated as someone who deserves to be <laughs> treated with respect and that's really all you're asking um and you might have to shout loud and high to, to for that voice to be heard mm -hmm. and it's the confidence that you can build within yourself that will help people who are ignorant to, to how to, um, you know, treat people with um, respect and dignity, that they um, learn and they, they, they you know, you, your, your response will hopefully give them a message to question why they may be, you know, responding in the way that they have. And I, 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 I've spoken to my, fo my foster a parent about this, um, and this is a personal point of view, because I grew up uh, having a child or fostering a child with a disability it, it's very educational and it, it it's very very good because it gives you a realization of of possibly how fortunate you are because mm. even with uh, my own difficulties and challenges I still count myself very fortunate yeah. because there are others that I have I live with mm. and that Aren't, aren't as like ha haven't as much mm. got as much and when you foster a child with a disability you get to see the challenges and struggles that's right yeah that. yeah and as you say like the like a prejudice in society with some people mm. I think that that is just you need more education on the subject yeah and it's just like an unknowing that's right kind of you come to learn more about yourself mm. and um the person with the disability becomes um, a, is able to think about themselves within the context of what they have and what they haven't got. So th even though they may have limitations, they are seeing it within the context of within those limitations, at least I can. I can use my wheelchair independently. I can go out and, you know, um, be independent in the um, community. Um, you know, I can you know manage to watch and dress myself so you you see the um positives it, within the limitations yeah For the carers i really do believe that they um carers who are willing to, to parent and, and care for a child with a disability they are really pushing their um you know chat th themselves in terms of overcoming perhaps what might be 
um, you know, hesitations or anxieties about their, the, what they feel they might be limited in being able to provide and actually surpass those expectations by being able to stick with the, the, the support and care that they're offering to this child and learning more about what they are able to learn and learning more about, you know, how this child's resilience an ability and capacity to, you know, fight on against, you know, the message that they're not going to be able to do things that they may have been written off about and, and see how they do progress through those barriers. Mm. And that is incredibly rewarding. Um, and it really takes, you know, a real kind of determined commitment on the part of the carer to stick with you know what might be new and uh, unfamiliar to them to really seeing that the more that they do the more progress this child makes in terms of you know what 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 was potentially written off I've heard you know many stories of you know children's um, conditions that have been you know kind of minimized because there, there's a view that oh they're never going to be able to progress beyond this point and that's why the EHCP plan you know does put that um, need to review the care and to ensure that whatever has been delivered is appropriate to where that child might be at any given point so if they have progress that it is adapted to meet the on you know the new needs that or the, the, the more developed needs that might now be apparent Mm. So, um, yeah, as we've said, the professional team around that child and young person is really crucial to making sure that we maximise that child's potential to the very best that they can be. Mm. And, um, yeah. yeah. And it's basically when you foster a child person with a disability, when they're growing up, it's, it's giving them that confidence to say, you can do this independently mm. you can do this mm. and to because that and that's what the main thing it is one of the challenges that they may face is just not having that confidence like oh i can't do this i can't do mm. that it's mm. like no but you can do this you may need yes. um this yes. from your ot or yes. uh, or you may need to have this aid mm. but with that aid you can do this that's right that's and that right gives the confidence to be more independent that's right it's and always about maximizing the potential for that um, person to be able to do as much as they can do um mm -hmm. because they're up against the odds where society's already put those limitations around them the, the um, institution might put those limitations around them and then the last thing you want is within the foster care that those limitations are, are also around them so it's always about pushing that barrier and saying that you know um you know this is what you can't do but this is what you can do and really the belief of the carer in their potential that's that's really uh, you know it might seem very simple but if that carer believes in your potential that's halfway to getting to that potential mm. i mean i can remember a child who was in a wheelchair and they were out in the community and, the, and somebody a member of the public started to talk to the carer and um they were talking over the young person as if they couldn't talk and as if they couldn't respond and the carer said talk to them talk to him his name's johnny talk to him he mm. can respond and it was just like you know that was such a kind of um, you know, a, a, a ha ha moment for the young person because they felt that, you know, their carer wasn't going to allow this member of the public to just treat them as though they were invisible, you know, that they couldn't even speak and respond. They're sitting in a wheelchair, they could, they still had a, a voice, they still they could hear and they could be communicated with. And that really empowered them. So, you know, just one example. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for chatting with me today. Mm, you're welcome. Very eye-opening. Yes, um, thank you. Very educational, I think. Mm, mm. Um, hopefully we've encouraged people not to, uh, encourage people to like look more at disability in a positive light. Yeah. And yeah. see the true potential of fostering a disabled child. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It can be incredibly um, rewarding because um, you're learning so much more about yourself and your potential as a carer, um, taking on new challenges of, of um, care that you've 
perhaps never um, discovered that you can do and really seeing how that can really benefit a child. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Verna, for welcome. being here. Uh, it's been lovely talking to you. Um, it's okay. lovely learning all about this. So okay. thank you very much. And thank right. you everyone for joining us. Please, please, please sign up to join us at the summit on Thursday. Um, it's from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, there's individual tickets for individual parts of the summit. Um, or you can do an all day ticket. Uh, it's completely free. Uh, please join us. We'd love to see you there. Thank okay. you. Thank you. We'll hope to see you again next next week.